on the working paper name from mass incarceration to smart decarceration from 2014, you express a first orientation to address the issue through the question, what steps are needed to move from mass incarceration to smart decarceration? Can you explain to us those steps from your current view? Yeah, I would say um, my view hasn't changed much since then, and all, and we've made some progress as a country with these steps, um, but there's still a lot to um, a lot to um, work, a lot of work to do. So one of the things that we outlined on that paper was this need to have um, public discourse. Um, uh, and discourse within the criminal justice systems around really what is the the um, utility and function of incarceration and when do we absolutely need to use it and when is it creating more harm um, than protecting public health and public safety and uh, what evidence continues to indicate for us is that uh, in most cases, our incarceration does in fact um, create more harm than to promote um, public health and public safety. Um, one of the other things that we talked about since then that I continue to say frequently, um, especially when I'm asked by media or at speaking events, um, what is the one thing that you could do to, uh, what's the one thing we could do to reform our criminal justice system? You know, if you had to identify one thing to reform our criminal justice system, what would that be? And my response is always don't do just one thing. Um, and that is because um, the, the interconnections of law enforcement contact to prosecutorial and judicial decisions to incarceration or community supervision to what happens afterwards they're, they're too linked, they're too strongly linked to make one a, a change at one point in the system without, um, with, uh, so you can make a change at one point and it could have very little impact if those changes are not positively reinforced um, throughout other aspects of the system. So one of the concepts that we mentioned in that paper and that I really um, continue to, to see evidence that it's needed is that we really need innovations across the entire spectrum of our criminal justice system. Um, from first uh, citizen encounter with law enforcement all the way to a person's release to community um, or release from community supervision um, in attempting to stabilize, um, stabilize in the community after criminal justice involvement. Um, the other piece that we talked about then that, again, I still find to be true and we're seeing more um, representation of is that doing criminal justice reform really has to be a criminal, a, a multidisciplinary, um, transdisciplinary approach, honestly. Um, there's not one perspective um, that's going to help to solve this problem and we really need to engage um, medical professionals, mental health professionals, sociologists, um, social workers, you know, all um, name, you name it, discipline um, to come up with the solutions uh, to craft policy recommendations and also to implement behavioral interventions um, at, at um, uh, criminal justice actor levels, as well as those individuals involved in the um, system. And then finally, um, one of the things that we were reflecting on in 2016 is still true for 2022, and that is that the evidence base of, um, of policies and practices that will promote um, a, a, a much more limited criminal justice system and that will help to achieve um, racial equity, socioeconomic equity, behavioral health equity, um, that evidence base is still very limited um, because we haven't invested a lot of time in researching what might be the best policy and practice approaches. Um, so uh, really evaluating, continuing to evaluate innovations that we adopt, as well as generate um, new data-driven uh, innovations is still critically needed and um, will be an essential part 
of long-term sustainable reform. Thank you.